Let us go ahead and start with Dr. Rodriguez's presentation. We are so proud of his generosity and his willingness to be with all of us this afternoon. Dr. Rodriguez is one of the top leadership and diversity experts, not only in our community, but across the country. He has been recognized as one of the top Latinos in diversity and inclusion. His new book, Authentico, has been hailed as a Latino manifesto on how Latinos can succeed in their careers. Dr. Rodriguez is the president of DRR Advisors and today is going to share with us Latino success strategies. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, and let's turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Juana, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. I'm really excited to, to be here and sharing some of my thoughts and experiences with you. My goal today is to definitely share with you some insights that I've learned along the way, uh, share with you some experiences, but more importantly, share with you some career success strategies that hopefully will help accelerate and elevate you to those career levels you wish to achieve. I do want this do want to make this as interactive as possible. So please don't hesitate to use the technology that we have. There's uh, opportunities for you to raise questions, to raise your hand. You know, I'll do my best to try to capture your or, and address your questions as you you know, pose them. But uh, you know, it'll really be helpful and make this as inter interactive as possible. So that way we we you know, we we it, interact with each other and, and I get a better sense of what what you're thinking of some of this context. So. You know, before I start with the actual presentation, I do want to share a little bit about my story, right? So you have a sense of who is this Robert Rodriguez guy? What's his background? So, uh, uh, you know, I usually lead with the fact that yo soy mexicano. So my parents were born in Mexico, uh, actually uh, in Matamoros, which is on the northern tip of uh, Mexico, right? A uh, uh, border city with Brownsville, Texas. They came to the U.S. Uh, became U.S. citizens, and I was born in Lubbock, Texas, so soy tejano. Um, great, uh, you know, so I'm very proud of that background. But at a very early age, my parents and I, we moved to the Midwest. We moved to Minnesota, actually. And, and a lot of folks will say, well, Robert, how is it that you were born in Texas but grew up in Minnesota? Uh, well, the short story is, is that my parents and I, we were migrant workers, right? So we used to go to Traverse City, Michigan, uh, to work the cherry field. We used to go to North Dakota to work the sugar beet fields. And then Unano Papi said, oh, mijo, there's a little Latino community on the west side of St. Paul, Minnesota. And that's where I grew up. Minnesota is a great place to live, great place to raise a family. But during my formative years as, as a young child in the 70s and 80s, not a very large Latino community in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, so at a very early age, I... You know, I guess I would say I struggled a little bit with my sense of identity because my parents, they're very well-intentioned, but some of their early messages to me were, oye, mijo, no hablas español, you know, just to simulate, just fit in. We don't want you to have an accent. We don't want you to get picked on by the local Anglo children. And so I did that, and I did that very well. So there I was growing up, you know, at home, you know, eating tamales, eating menudo, you know, dancing my salsa. But as soon as I left my, my household, you know, Try to kind of downplay, if you will, my ethnicity. Um, yeah, that served me well early on, you know, when I was a, 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 a student in, in high school and a little bit in college. But definitely when I got into my career, that's where I started to notice that, you know, this is, a, you know, something that I need to look into. So I don't know if that experience is similar for any of you, but, but what I'm going to be talking about here today is very much focused on you know, what's it like and where are some success strategies that you can have in your career? Probably with a little bit of a heavier emphasis on the corporate side. I know many of you may be either still students or working at nonprofits. That's okay. I, I fundamentally believe that these concepts and principles apply. Uh, but I did want to give you a bit of my background so you know kind of the perspective that, uh, that I bring to our conversations here today. I, I can say easily without any hesitation that my career really took off when I started leveraging my, leveraging my ethnicity as an asset and as a source of strength. So my hope is that you'll learn from my experience some of the things I've learned along the way to hopefully put you in a similar position. So with that, let's, let's get started. So as I go to this slide, this is some of the corporate experience that I want to bring to this conversation. These are all corporations, many of you that I'm sure are very, very familiar with, 
that have, you know, brought me in as a consultant to kind of help them with their Latino leadership initiatives. It's either been a, a Latino talent acquisition, you know, uh, engagement, uh, Latino retention, a lot recently more focused on Latino leadership development. So when it comes to Latino initiatives in corporate America, I, I can say very easily that I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Uh, but what this, but what working with this many companies does is that it gives me a chance to say, hey, what's the discourse? What's the narrative? What's trending? What are some best practices that we're seeing with regards to how corporations are addressing the Latino experience in corporate America, and what can we learn from that? So I want all of you to benefit from this experience because this is the this is where I'm getting a lot of this data, a lot of the, the, this is where these concepts that I'm about to share with you are coming from. It's from real life experiences working with leading employers uh, that apply that can apply to you regardless of what industry you're in. So I just wanted to share that briefly. You know, I have written uh, a couple books. You know, I'll, I'll talk more about the the second one in a moment. The first book, Latino Talent, you know, came out uh, about 2008, I believe. It's been a while. Uh, but that, uh, it's called Latino Talent, Effective Strategies to Recruit, Retain, Develop Hispanic Professionals. That was written more for non-Latinos, right? You know, what can they do? What can they learn more about us so they can have more effective strategies? The, the next book, and one that's going to be the focus of our conversation here today, is that one that just came out this last uh, September uh, of 2017. It's called Authentico, The Definitive Guide to Latino Career Success. And I do have a co-author. His name is Andres Tapia. He's an executive at Corn Ferry, uh, Peruvian, born and raised in Peru, uh, but uh, has been in the U.S. very much his, his entire adult life. And so, so we did a lot of work to put this together. And this book, Authentico, is written by Latinos, about Latinos, for Latinos. So we're going to talk about some of those concepts here today. So it's a very different focus than Latino talent. But uh, in doing some of this research for this book, that's what gave us some of these insights that we're going to talk about in just a second. So again, as I, just a re reminder, as I keep moving forward to some of these slides, don't hesitate if, if you have a question or whatever, just don't be shy and just post it and we'll make sure to uh, address it or either Juan or Chris will, will tag me to make sure to uh, uh, see if I can uh, address it. Anyhow, so what are we seeing? Real quickly, because this gives us a, a platform, right, for the rest of the conversation, is there is a tremendous amount of history right now in the Latino community in the United States. And, and there's two main reasons driving that, right? First is that they, the you know, corporations, organizations see our community as a catalyst for economic growth, right? You know, our purchasing power here in the United States is growing at a tremendous rate. Uh, it, you know, we're, we're one of the top 15 economies in the world if you just look at the Latino spend in the United States. And what organizations are basically saying is they want more Latinos and Latinas, like many of us on the call, to shop in their stores, eat at their restaurants, buy their widgets, right? So the fact that we are a, you know, a consumer segment that's growing, you know, puts, puts a lot of interest on us from, from mainly that corporate sector, right? The other part, however, that's been relatively new, newer, is that corporations are seen as, as the next great source of intellectual capital. You know, if you look at the demographics, folks, and a lot of you have probably seen this data, but without a doubt, the workforce of the future is going to have an increasingly Latino identity, right? There's just going to be more of us in, uh, in, in as far as the percentage of the population, but more of us in the workplace. So companies are starting to read those tea leaves, right? They're saying, okay, if there's going to be more of those then working at our nonprofits, working in government, hopefully working in corporate America, what can we do to better connect with them? Because if we connect with this Latino segment, we're going to have a competitive advantage. So he's put these two aspects together. That's driving a lot of interest in us. And so, so my opinion, uh, at least, is that this serves us well. This makes us more relevant. You know, that with more visibility uh, in our community, hopefully it comes more opportunity, right? Now, there is a flip side, and some of you may have seen this in the news, and, we, and I don't want to ignore it for this call. Uh, is that, you know, you, you, it's hard to deny that there is a bit of a anti-Latino sentiment, right? Anti-immigration sentiment. You know, you've seen it build the wall, you know, all this stuff. You know, so, so that's also playing out right now. So, so what's interesting is that as you go through this, you know, companies are saying, hey, we want Latino executives. But to be fully frank and fully transparent, we're, we're not making a lot of progress. And, and, and 
you know, there's a lot of organizations, lots of nonprofits, people like myself and Juana and many others who are trying to see how we can change this. But if you look at just some of the percentages, even though our percentage of the population is growing at a pretty fast rate, you know, our kind of representation in leadership roles on corporate boards is not growing. So, so there's something off, right? You know, it's hard to say, well, how can our population be growing? How can be, you know, Robert, if you're saying that all these companies that want to hire us and they want us to shop in their stores, how come there aren't more of us in senior level roles? And that's one of the things we're trying to address. And that's one of the things we're having this, this call, right, to say, well, how can we help you be better prepared for these opportunities that we definitely see are out there? We have to make sure that we're fully prepared as they come around. So, so that's a little bit of context, right? So we shared with you a little bit about what we're seeing in corporate America, why the interest, give me a little bit of data. But here, you know, I'd love to, for us to, again, may, maybe have that first interactive point of, of the presentation. Here's a, a quick poll, hopefully the technology will work here. But I want to get your thoughts. For those of you 60 or whatever on the call, you know, answer this question for me to say, hey, when you think about being Latino or being Hispanic in the workplace, do you think today that, A, yes, that provides you with a benefit that, hey, me, my Latino, Hispanic ethnicity, you know, benefits me and there's value to it, you know, please answer yes. Or if you say, nah, you know, yeah, I'm Latino, but it, it plays no difference or it doesn't give me any benefits. It, it's a non-issue. So you would click no. I just would love to kind of get your sense as to say, hey, yes, it helps me, B, uh, not so much. So, so we'll leave that open here for maybe a few seconds. Love to kind of get your thoughts. All right. So, um, so I'm, you know, we're going to close this out quickly because um, the numbers there. But it looked like uh, almost, uh, you know, four out of five of you. So almost eighty percent of you think that uh, your Latino ethnicity is, is is a benefit and is an asset and, and serves us well. That's that's awesome. And for those of you who don't, that's okay, right? There's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, but what I'm here to say and what, and what we're starting to see is that that Latino ethnicity is becoming more of an asset, more of a benefit. And, and hopefully in these next few, few slides, you'll understand why. So thank you first for taking that poll, giving me a little bit insight of where we're at. Personally, here's kind of my take on all this. If, if you know, for those of you who are investors and, you know, you know the rules of investing, hey, you buy a stock when it's low and, and hope that that value goes up so you, you know, make money. Well, my perspective is, is that if, being, if, if the, the, the aspect of being Latino, if that were a stock, let me tell you right now, I'd buy it, right? Because I only see our influence, our relevance, our credibility, our size, our impact our influence, I only see that going up, right? Now, we may be hitting a little bit of a bump here with this anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-Latino sentiment that I talked about, but what I'm seeing, everything that I'm hearing, particularly from more of a corporate environment, right, is saying that, hey, this, this Latino thing, it's, it's, it's something that we need to tap into, and if we leverage it well, it'll help benefit us. So, so, so you may be asking, well, Robert, what, what makes you say that? You know, where, where is that sentiment? Where is that feeling coming from? And that's where Authentico comes in. So this is the, you know, the, the book that I just mentioned earlier, brand new, hot off the press. Hopefully you'll go out when you, when you go get you know, one of Juana's books. Hopefully you'll pick up one of mine, right? Uh, but here's Authentico. It's available on Amazon. But, but one of the things that we wanted to show is you know, we did a lot of research for this book. So one is both myself and, and on the desk, we have over 30 years of experience working on Latino initiatives, right? Like I said earlier, we've helped companies recruit Latinos, Latino leadership development programs, Latino summits, Latino caucuses, you name it. We've seen a lot of it, so we, some of the data comes from there. We interviewed 20 Latino and Latina executives, and I'll show you who they are in just a second, but these were high flyers, go-getters, you know, top of the top, and say, hey, what, what got you to that level, right? Uh, we did interviews with Latino millennials that say, okay, well, a lot of these Latino executives, you know, they're mostly baby boomers. They've been around corporate America, been working for a while. But what about the younger Latinos? What, what are they saying? What's their perspective on all this? Uh, we did some focus groups. We did some focus groups with just Latinas, which were incredibly, you know, insightful and interesting, right? To say, what's, what's specifically the Latina experience 
and then we did a couple surveys. So we pulled all of this stuff together, and we started to get some interesting insights. So, so he, you know, first, you know, just to share with you, you know, who are the 20 folks that we spoke to? Yeah, again, you know, I'm not going to go through all these. Maybe you recognize some of these names, but we, we have folks like Paul Raines, the CEO of GameStop. He's on the board of directors of J.C. Penney's. Darren Ravale, uh, West Point graduate. He's the president of IHOP. You know, Luis Sabina, Harvard MBA, partner at McKinsey, Georgia Data, you know, and you can look over their pedigree in a little bit. But, again, as you can see, these are folks who present uh, very heavy, again, on the corporate experience. Uh, but CEOs, C-suite, many of these folks are on corporate boards. So these folks are individuals who have achieved the very top within a corporate environment. A lot of us want to have careers like these folks. So... They can teach us a lot. They can say, hey, what, how did you get there? What did you do? What's the secret sauce, right, that helped you to have some of that success? And that's, you know, some of the things that we're going to highlight. So, so first off, so, so here are some things that, uh, this is a very important slide, so I don't want to rush through this one. But there's a couple of things that really stood out for us, and hopefully this will resonate for you. Some of us, Juana will probably recognize because it just totally validates and builds upon what her research has proven in the past. But the first one is, is that these folks have benefited because they have the, what we, we're calling the power of a bicultural identity. You know, the fact that many of us, and like I shared earlier, my experience, the fact that many of us, that we can walk in two worlds, we, you know, when we're at home with our Latino and Latina family, we, we know what that means. But when we're in a more Anglo, almost all Anglo work environment, we can operate there too, right? So, so we know what it's like. We have that understanding of that bicultural experience. And for many companies, that's an asset. That's a benefit because our workforce, or I'm sorry, not only the workforce becoming more bicultural, but companies, consumers, and customers, and how they provide their products and services, it's more to a bicultural audience. So the more that we, because we have that experience, that benefits us. So a lot of these executives talk to that to say, hey, the fact that I understood these nuances that helped me penetrate this market, it helped me to understand these consumers in a way that some of my professional colleagues couldn't because they didn't have that bicultural identity. So that, that, I thought that was very powerful. The other part was what we're calling the power of that global perspective. You know, there's a lot of us, and I'm assuming some of you on the call, who were maybe born outside of the U.S., maybe born in Latin America, Venezuela, like Colombia, Peru, Argentina, you know, the Benin Republic, Puerto Rico, you, you name it, right? And some of you maybe grew up there and now are working here in the United States. Well, well, well because of that experience, that, that's almost, you know, Latinos in, in many essence epitomize what it means to be global, right? And as our corporations, as our organizations are becoming more global, we almost serve as the ideal archetype of that global perspective. And we have the, the foundation to be global leaders by tapping into that experience, right? So that's something that these executives and all this research is pointing out to us to say, hey, those two, you know, uh, kind of boxes on the top, that's a very powerful skills and those are very powerful experiences. And that's something that we bring to the table. Uh, the one on the bottom left, you know, the power of sacrifice, right? You know, as Juan loves to, to say, hey, that it's the power of many, you know, that, that for many of us, when we get into situations where we're somewhat hesitant, when we're struggling, when we maybe lack confidence, that we can maybe call up the experiences of our family, right? You know, for me, it's, it's just one generation ago, right? The, the sacrifices that my parents made to come here to the U.S. to give me more opportunity, you know, is a motivator. And, and whenever I've struggled or I've hesitated, I just think about the, the sacrifices that they made, and that gives me the strength. That gives me the courage to say, you know what, Mita, if, if I don't take advantage of this opportunity, if I don't do everything that I can to be successful, it's a, it's a dishonor to those sacrifices my parents and my family made. So, so we're... Um, but so, so we're, you know, we, it's, it's like this thing that is helping us. And for a lot of these executives, a lot of these millennials and these folks in these focus groups, they, they, they fall back on that. They say, whenever I'm struggling, I just say, hey, you know, you know, a lot of folks, you know, struggled and sacrificed a lot to put me in this position. So I'm going to, I'm going to have at it. That gives me the ganas to, to go ahead and proceed. 
And then the fourth is, is the power of youth, right? Again, building on some of the work that Juan has done before, that, that our community, our average age is much younger. So with us comes all the hope uh, and promise that comes with, you know, that, that that's kind of associated with youth. So, you know, so you start pulling these things together, hopefully you start getting a little bit of a glimpse. I said, okay, Robert, I see what you're saying. You know, these things are, you know, make sense. You know, how can the, you know, I can see how this might benefit me, but but tell me more, right? What else is there? And that's, you know, we're going to keep moving forward. But again, don't be shy, folks. Um, you know, let me know what the, what, what your questions are um, as we move forward here. So so a couple of these next few slides are going to be talking about what we're calling the a Latino talent manifesto. They're almost declarative statements that hopefully you'll see and, and they'll resonate with you. And, and let me just read these through in here and, and maybe you'll give me some sort of reaction. But first is that the next generation of Latino leaders can be more powerful by pursuing that path of a bicultural identity. So, so like what we said earlier, this bicultural identity, it's real. So we should resist that assimilation and instead develop that differentiating American Latino identity that embraces and celebrates the multiple influences of mainstream American culture and, and, and that of one specific Latino heritage. So don't deny it. Don't downplay it. It doesn't say that's everything that you are, but it is part of who you are. Hopefully it's part of how you see yourself. So let's leverage that because by doing so, we're going to be more authentic, right? We don't have to downplay who ourselves. We get to leverage those powers, right? The bicultural perspective, the power of the global viewpoint. And plus, it allows us to be stronger ambassadors for the Latino community. Once we're more connected with our bicultural identity, we're much uh, more capable and able to serve as ambassadors, for, as advocates for kind of Latino issues and Latino initiatives. We absolutely need this, and I'm very excited that those of you who have jumped on this call hopefully are kind of tapping into that to say, yeah, I see that. That makes sense. That if, if I, live, I need to leverage that bicultural identity. Uh, next part, very important. Again, we, you know, going back to what Juan has said before, uh, the, you know, there's, with, with, with our community comes the power of many. But what this says is that as Latino leaders, for those of us who have achieved some success, we have to give back. We, we, we can't forget those uh, who are still waiting for their opportunity. And, and so, so we actually found a distinction we were doing in the, in the book. You, know, you saw earlier that list of all those 20 executives all those individuals have achieved high personal achievement, right? But to us, we didn't consider them being excellent until they leveraged that personal achievement to help others, right? And that's what we're saying is absolutely critical. We need this as a community. Hopefully those of you on the call are demonstrating this, that true excellence requires that we leverage that high personal achievement that we've achieved to help others succeed. We need to kind of you know, put our hand out and help elevate and, and kind of raise the next generation. And for for that Latino or Latino leader who hasn't done that, even though they may have achieved that personal uh, achievement, they're still not demonstrating what we're calling excellence, right? Because their their journey isn't complete, right? Because they haven't leveraged that excellence to give back. This is a big problem, by the way. Well, I don't know if problem is the right word. This is a big opportunity right now in a lot of the work that, I'm doing, I know Juana is doing, and others, to say, how do we get more of those Latino and Latina executives to give back and be more visible and be more kind of supportive of Latino issues, causes, and helping to promote the next generation? Um, so if we do that, you know, how do we do that? You know, we should mentor and sponsor others. Of course, as I said earlier, advocate for Latino issues. Uh, join your Latino organizations. There's lots of powerful Latino nonprofits. You know, Alpha, Prospanica, Shift, you know, Acer, National Hispanic Corporate Council, LULAC, NCLR, you know, the list goes on and on, uh, or Unidos US, I, should, I forget about their name change. But you know, join those organizations, join those Latino employee resource groups. Those are just great ways for not to develop your network and build skills, but also a great way for you to give back. And for those of you who are leaders, maybe have achieved some level of success, maybe you run a department or a budget or a team, you don't just mentor younger Latinos, fund their leadership development, you know, help, you know, provide money for a scholarship, help pay for them to go to a, you know, the, the Young Hispanic Corporate Achievers Program and whatnot. You know, we need to help fund those, those, uh, those that next generation to help in their investment. So those are a couple other things. 
we'll keep moving forward. We're about halfway through this webinar and uh, about halfway through this slide, so we're right on point. Um, so this is something really interesting. This was somewhat of that, that surprised us a little bit is that uh, a lot of the executives that we spoke to, a lot of the, the millennials and, and the focus groups, is they're saying that as they achieve some success, there were some folks within our own community who were like, you know, guess it, Clay, right? You know, who's he think he is or who she thinks she is? She thinks she's better than us. You know, she used to be an employee like us. Now she's a manager. You know, what, you know, what's that all about? And, you know, why are you going? There's some of us who, you know, when we, you know, this is a very personal story of mine that I'll share that, you know, when I graduated high school and went to college, uh, even my family was very happy, but I have to admit, a lot of my cousins, they, you know, they, they're they like, Bobby, who do you think you are? You know, you think you're better than us by going to college? I'm like, no, I don't want to be better. I, I just want to be successful, right? So, so, but, so that's where this, this statement comes in the, in the manifesto that as with the we must embrace ambition as an honorable intent. So, yeah, we can still be humble. You know, we don't have to brag. Uh, but let's not be naive. So, you know, no one's going to hand opportunities to us. We need to seek them out. And for those who do seek those out, for those who want to improve their stead, we need to encourage that. We need to celebrate that and not knock it down, not make fun of them, not say, hey, you know, you think you're being better than us. We need to advocate for that because that's how, if one of us succeeds, we can all potentially succeed. Uh, but we need to do that. And this is, again, something that surprised us a little bit. We weren't expecting this. So, so how does that play out? You take those risky, risky assignments, those stretch assignments. You know, remember, if you are a bit hesitant, remember those sacrifices, develop a career plan. Um, but this final one's a big one in our community. We can probably do a whole webinar, and that is we need to be more open to relocation and career mobility. I've, I've seen way too many Latino and Latina early careers kind of get you know stifled a little bit because we don't want to move away from our family. And, and I get that. Our family is the most important unit in our community, um, but when we do kind of limit ourselves, it, it just it does tend to put a, a certain cap on our availability to go up. So we should always address that. I'm not going to knock anybody whatsoever who turns on an opportunity because they don't want to relocate. I you know I, I celebrate that, but but please you know give it a full vetting uh, before you make that decision. And then the last manifesto, and then we'll get some into some very specific things, um, is. You know, Latinos need to get over their ambivalence to, of, about power. Again, something that came up in, in a, a lot of our research. It was this, you know, hey, you know, while ambition is personal, power is collective. Again, going back to Juana, uh, the power of many. And that we need to be more comfortable with how do we, what's our relationship with power? How do I get power within my organization? And once I get it, how do I wield it? We have uh, a lot of Latino and Latina executives, not, not maybe not the ones that we interviewed, but who have influence within their organizations, and they're just not comfortable wielding it. And, and let me tell you, there's folks in other communities who are, you know, very adept at the power game, and we're still kind of learning that. So, you know, as we, as you look at kind of your professional development, your career advancement, again, whether in corporate America or nonprofit. Look at this issue of power and influence and, and be more adept to that. So, you know, try to develop your influencing, your conflict management skills, look at your network, advocate for a high potential talent, and again, work on your personal brand executive presence, and we'll get to that in just a second. So uh, I'm going to pause here, see if I can see uh, any questions. Um, I can't read the whole question here. I'll just pop here. Uh, oh, it looks like someone grew up in Amarillo. You know, it sounds like for a lot of you to say, hey, this is this is working. Hopefully you can see the slides. Um, anyhow, uh, I'll, I'll keep moving. And, and at the end, I'll, I'll share my contact information for any of you who want to follow up. Um, but this is some very exciting stuff, and I'm glad to be able to have this opportunity to share this with all of you. Let's move on to some more specific things, right? And then we'll kind of, you know, leave it open for uh, even more questions or comments that they have. Uh, so again, just to reiterate, you know, our ethnicity, uh, you know, it, it, it serves as an asset. It serves as a source of strength. You know, kind of going back, I'm going to slow down here because we do have this, you know, this this time. You know, when I shared with you earlier how I struggled with my personal identity, 
and then I came to the realization that you know my Latino this is a big part of who I am, uh, particularly over the last well I'd say you know six to eight years you know I've dug deep to really get more connected with my Spanish Latino Hispanic Mexican heritage, and that has served me so well. Uh, it's helped make me a more global citizen. It's helped me to connect with a much bigger community. You know, it's it's. I, I described it to someone the other day as I felt like uh, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, right? When she lands in Oz and she opens up her eyes, everything's in color. <laughs> That's what I felt like, right? Because I, 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 I'm like, wow, I've been missing all this. And just to give you just a real quick example, you know, yesterday I was on the call with Chris, who's kind of the, the individual kind of helping, you know, from the technology and the platform. And I was talking to Chris, and she said, oh, yeah, I'm from Venezuela. And, and five years ago, six years ago, she would have said, I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, Venezuela is a great country, but I didn't know much about it. Now, and, and maybe Chris can attest to this or not, but also the next thing, I knew it was like, oh, you're from Venezuela. Are you from Mar Maracaibo or Caracas or Valencia? Oh, uh, terrible what's happening right now in Venezuela. I can't believe Maduro's holding on the power. And that that one's Chavez. But it, we were able to have a conversation that allowed us to have that little better connection. And that's something that I've experienced all the time now because of this stronger connection that I have with my ethnicity. So so those are the things that as we become more connected with our Hispanic heritage, it makes us a more global citizen and make, allows us to connect with others on a much deeper level. And I, I can't remember who said it, but there's that saying out there that says, you know, people won't always remember what you say to them, but they'll remember how you made them feel, right? And I'm telling you this, you know, connecting with your Latino heritage is a way to allow you to maximize that. The next thing, and this is kind of building onto that, right, is this concept of executive presence. As we spoke to these executives, that's something that a lot of them said is like, you know, why were you all, I started getting feedback that, you know, I exuded this presence that this kind of this, it's, it's you know, it's this quality that, that true leaders exude that telegraphs say, hey, I'm in charge, or if I'm not in charge today, I, I deserve to be, right? And and people ask me, Robert, how do you define it, right? I think it's it's hard to define, but you definitely know it when you see it, right? And, and so, so the best thing I can do is list some things here. Um, <clears throat> that says, um, you know, what what does executives, you know, how do you convey that? So, you know, these, what, six, seven items there. One is, you know, are you able to can, you know, maintain your composure, particularly when things are tough? You know, are you able to connect people? You know, when you meet them, like that little story I shared yesterday with, with Chris, you know, we were able to have a quick connection, even though we never met in person. You know, do you convey confidence, right? Do you... You know, when you walk into the rooms, like, hey, this person knows what they're talking about. Are, are you credible? Do you speak with clarity? Are you concise? Do you have some charisma? You start putting all those things together, and you start getting that executive presence. So I know there's a lot of workshops, lots of, uh, you know, maybe webinars as well, you know, things related to executive presence. I would encourage you to pursue those because it just it, it doesn't necessarily give you more skills, but it does, it does allow you to convey a certain kind of a, a certain aura, a certain kind of, you know, attitude that companies want, right? And and, and companies need to just kind of, you know, serve us well. A couple more, uh, this issue of, of uh, your brand. And, and probably the, the best way I can convey this slide as we start kind of wrapping this up is to remind all of you that within your organization, whether you're in corporate America, a nonprofit, government, maybe you're an entrepreneur, um, you're going to move up because you're smart and because you work hard, right? That's going to serve you well, and you're going to start moving up. Okay, I'm moving up. I'm smart. I'm figuring out problems. I'm moving up. I'm, I'm working hard. I'm moving up the corporate ladder. I'm moving up the career ladder. But sooner or later, all of you, you're going to, you're going to get to a level where everybody else is smart and everybody else works hard. That's when you get to a pivot point because now you have to find a way to differentiate yourself from all the smart, hardworking people in the room. And that's not easy to do. It takes time. It takes energy. But you have to figure out what is your brand, right? What is it that makes you different from all the smart, hardworking people? And, you know, it's, it's funny. And I struggled with this too. So, 
you know, when when people used to ask me earlier on in my career, Robert, what's, well, what you know, what's your brand, right? And I would tell them things that were very generic. Well, that's easy. I'm smart. I'm loyal. I'm dependable. I'm honest. I'm reliable. And, and I would tell those folks, and I said, like, you know, they they would almost start yawning, right? It's like boring, right? Robert, who else isn't reliable, dependable, honest? You know, right? Those those things are very generic. What what makes you distinctive, right? What is it about you that differentiates you? And for me, because of where I was at, um, yeah, I was able to kind of leverage that. You know, well, I, you know, I'm a, I have a PhD. Yes, I'm a scholar practitioner. I've written a couple of books. I've, you know, I've done this research. I'm an expert on Latino employee resource groups and Latino. Those were things that are very distinctive and helped to elevate me. Um, some of the things that you're doing. Uh, a, Quick question here someone asked is, uh, I think it was Mary Jo, thank you for asking that. But, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, we need to look at how can we better help uh, Latinx students understand their identity and their cultural value early and middle and high school and, and how to make it. I think that's a very important point. Uh, something that definitely came out in talking with the millennials. Um, here's all I can say about that is that uh, one of the reasons some students and some folks early in their careers who are choosing not to connect with their ethnicity is because, you know, the the perception, and it's not reality, but the perception that if we are successful, if we get a scholarship, if we get it admitted to a certain college, if we get hired or if we get promoted, it's because affirmative action, or you're you're just filling a quota. You're definitely not the most qualified person, we're lowering the bar for you, right? And so so one of the reasons we found that some students uh, and some early career professionals are choosing not to connect with their heritage is because they don't want that stigma. They don't want to say, hey, I'm here because of my merits, I'm here because I work hard, not because of anyone else, you know, is helping me out. And, and I get that, right? But here's two things. Um, and one of the things that we need to tell more of our middle and high school students is that, A, that's not true. You know, no one's hiring us. No one's promoting us. No one's giving us a scholarship just because of the Hispanic ethnicity, right? You know, we still have to, you know, perform and deliver. But the other part, this is a big realization from a lot of the Latino millennials we spoke to, is that when they look at who's saying that stuff, oh, you're just hired because of affirmative action, EEOC, quotas, it's usually non-Latinos, right? And it's a way for them to make you kind of question yourself, you know, you know, make it second guess yourself, um, because A, it makes them feel better about them, right? Well, of course that Latina got hired because of over me because, because of some quota system. Um, so, so we have to keep those things in mind. So A, it's not true, and B, it's non-Latinos who are saying this, that we can't let that cheese mail, that rumor mill, that gossip, that that you know those those rumors, whatever, allow and prevent us from taking advantage of those opportunities. So, yeah, I don't know if Mary Jo, if I answered your question, you know, thoroughly, but I definitely agree with you. We need to help our middle and high school kids understand the importance of leveraging their identity. Uh, one way, great way to do it is to lead by example. So for us who have achieved some success to go out there, mentor, and speak to schools, and speak to students, and uh, serve as a mentor. The other part is to maybe share some of the things that, that we, we're talking about here, to say, hey, you know, folks are gonna say that you're not moving up because of your merits, and, and tell them, hey, that's not true. You're still delivering results, and hopefully that'll help them along that journey. So thanks for that question. Uh, moving on, as we have about 15 minutes to go, and I, I wanna leave some time for Juana and, and some more questions. Um, this is a, another one. Uh, it's, it's related to our ability to to build relationships and to network. And, you know, I'm not going to beat a dead horse. You know, we all know that it's important to network. It's important to, to build your professional kind of group of colleagues. Uh, and, and there's lots of workshops, webinars on how to network more effectively. But, but here's a, a fundamental key that, that has really served well. And probably the best way that I can describe it is to tell you a quick story about a young gentleman that I met named Pedro. So I met this, uh, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, it wasn't that long ago, uh, I met this uh, uh, young Latino professional, his uh, name was Pedro, he went to a top tier school, if I recall correctly, he went to Brown University, Ivy League, um, you know, sharp kid, you know, maybe, you know, 
mid to late 20s, met him at a conference, somewhat an impressive guy. And I'm like, hey, I'd, l- I'd like to help him out. And then when I found out he lived in Chicago, where I live, I'm like, great, I'm going to help out Pedro. So one day I reached out to Pedro uh, because he told me he worked downtown Chicago. I said, hey, Pedro, I'm going to be right by your office next Tuesday. You know, uh, I'm going to be there mid-morning. I can get together for breakfast or lunch. Would you like to get together? Uh, and Pedro's response was, Robert, thanks for reaching out to, love to, I can't, I'm really busy. Okay, yeah, I get it. You know, just caught him at a bed day. I remember that Pedro told me he liked to play golf. So maybe about a month, you know, six weeks later, my buddies and I were playing golf on a Saturday. We had an extra spot on our foursome. So I called up Pedro. I was like, hey, Pedro, this weekend I'm playing golf with some buddies. We have an extra spot. I remember you said you like to play golf. Would you like to join us? Pedro's response to, oh, Robert, thank you for reaching out. Love to. I can't. I'm really busy. Okay. Third time, I sponsored an event at a nonprofit that allowed me to have a table at their gala. I had an extra spot at my table uh, for Pedro, and I invited them on. I'm like, Pedro, I got this event on this date. Would you like to join me as my guest at my table? To which Pedro's response was, Robert, thanks for reaching out. I love to. I can't. I'm really busy. So three times I reached out to Pedro. I guess he's a busy guy. Well, not much, maybe three months after that last uh, outreach, because after three times I gave up, right? Um, Pedro reached out to me. He gave me a call. He said, Robert, old buddy, old pal, I just got laid off from my company. I'm in transition. Would you like to get together for, for lunch? And as I tell that story, there's a lot of folks say, what did you tell him, that you were really busy and you said no? And my response was, uh, no. I, I told him, Pedro, I'd love to get together for lunch because I still like the kid, right? Uh, but that lunch came with a lecture, right? Because when Pedro and I sat down, I said, oh, I you mean, know, Pedro, this is some a teachable moment. When I was reaching out to you, it was because I wanted to get to know you. I wanted to see if I can help you. I wanted to build a connection. And I get it. You were busy. Well, you know what, Pedro? I'm busy too, right? And now the fact that you only reached out to me because you think you need my help, you don't, you're not asking how I'm doing. You're not inviting me to do anything. It, you know, it, it's, it's, it's what I have here on the slide. It's an example of 911 networking. We can't fall into that trap. As we meet people on our journeys, as we meet people when we go to conferences, we have to invest in those relationships. We have to, you know, build equity in them. So that way, when we do need somebody's help, it's not the first time that they've heard from us. So, again, I don't want to sound like I'm preaching, I'm lecturing, but I see this a lot, particularly with younger career professionals who, you know, they're still trying to develop their craft. I get it. But but that networking, those relationships you build are so important, and, and they're very much built on generosity. Again, another thing that I've learned from Juan over the years is that all this is built on generosity, so we need to give of ourselves, and, and maybe it gets paid back, but that's not why we do it, right? So so these are some examples that we heard throughout some of these uh, interviews and, and kind of workshops with these folks. So, uh, And then the last thing that I'll share with before I kind of wrap up, leave some time for questions, is this concept of, you know, if you kind of put your stuff out there, if you develop your brand, if you kind of are comfortable with your ethnicity, if, if you're authentic, you're going to start building what I call these four levels of loyalty in your career. And, and what are those four levels? It, it's Level one is what I call recognition. You know, when your name appears in someone org's chart, to say, oh, yeah, I know Mary Jo. She asked me a question during that webinar. That's great. Or, oh, yeah, I know, I know Chris. She's from Venezuela. I met her when we did this webinar. You know, do people recognize you when, when your name comes up? The next level is what I call preference, okay? So not only do they recognize you, but if they're given a choice to either work with you or somebody else, they're going to say, you know what? Yep, you know, I met uh, Mary Jo and I met uh, Patty. I'm going to prefer to work with Mary Jo. I'm going to prefer to work with Chris. You know, are people preferring you over somebody else? Right? You want to get to that level. Third is what I call insistence, right? When people say, you know, I don't care who's available. I only want to work with Mary Jo. I only want to work with Chris. I only want to work with whomever, right? Or people are in being insistent on your behalf. And then the fourth level 
Uh, it's not always easy to achieve, but it's like a level that, you know, hopefully, Juana, you'll agree with this is, you know, a level where what we call sponsorship. That is, if Juana calls and says, Robert, can you help me with this? I'm there. I'll, I'll do anything for Juana. I'm sure she will do anything for me. You kind of get that level where there's sponsors out there advocating and supporting your every move. Anyhow, you don't get these four levels of loyalty without doing those things that we've talked about so far in the webinar. You, you're leveraging your ethnicity as an asset. You're kind of tying into your bicultural, maybe bi-global experience. You're leveraging the sacrifices of, of others before you. you know, you're, you're, you're networking effectively. You're building your executive presence. You're being generous. All those sorts of things start building your loyalty. And then what ultimately happens, and I'll kind of end up with this, is that you start getting other people, what I call, wearing your T-shirt. Now, you know, you bring some rubber. What are you talking about? It's some kind of gross, right? <laughs> you know, someone wearing your T-shirt. But the best way I can convey it is that, you know, one of the first slides that I showed was a slide with all those corporate logos. Um, you know, folks, that I don't go out to companies anymore and call them up and say, hey, PepsiCo, hey, you know, McDonald's, hey, you know, Home Depot, do you need a speaker? You know, do you need my help? I don't do that anymore because what's happening is I have folks out there in my network, in the community, who are saying, hey, I know a guy. I know this Dr. Rodriguez guy. He wrote these two books. I heard him on a webinar, and they're, in essence, wearing my t shirt. So I don't have to walk into a room and say, with a t shirt that says, Mito Robert Rodriguez is the best. I'm the bomb. I'm the, you know, I got my act together. I don't need to do that, right? That's bragging. But figuratively, I have other people wearing my t shirt who are out there advocating on my behalf. And that's what provides opportunity. Um, so hopefully you'll get other people to wear your t shirt. Uh, and one of the best ways to do it is, is through the things that we've talked about. So with that said, I'm going to wrap this up. That's kind of the end of my portion. You know, there's my phone. There's my email. I'm all over social media. Tag me, follow me, you know, link in with me, you know, whatever. Uh, love to stay connected with all of you. Uh, I'm trying to find the best way to answer all these questions. There's there's a lot of them. Um, you know, but and maybe before we do that, I want to make sure that I give Juana, you know, time because we have about five minutes left. Uh, but that's pretty much all what I had. What what I'll do is what I'll promise is I'll work with uh, Chris and, and try to leverage this technology, see if I can get a list of all the questions for those of you who submitted, and maybe find a way to respond to you via email, because I think all of you had to log in using your email. Um, I'll see if I can find that says, hey, you know, I'm the person from Oregon, you know, see if I can answer your questions. Uh, if you want a copy of this deck, you know, either you know, maybe I can work with Juana or contact me. I'll, I'll send you a copy. Uh, but I'm hoping that you found this webinar insightful, someone interesting. The time goes by quick. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always here to help and go out there, represent, and hopefully this helped you on your career journey. So with that, Juana, I'll turn it over to you. Well, first of all, one of the ways we can thank Robert for his wonderful presentation and his generosity is to buy his book, Authentico. I know as a Latino author that we need to promote each other and knowledge is power, saber es poder. And uh, he's done a lot of work in putting together some strategies that can help you in your success. And if you've enjoyed meeting uh, Dr. Rodriguez, please tune in on March 21st for the uh, webinar that I'll be doing, Si Se Puede Con Cesar Chavez, uh, celebrating his life, but more than that, showing how his work was a prototype for Latino leadership in the 21st century. And then following that, a wonderful presentation on balance, on being able to stay centered and have clarity and bring your leadership skills to the long haul by being mindful. And then finally, something that I have found tremendously um, useful, in fact, I just negotiated a contract today, asked for more money and asked them to buy books because I have read The Art of Getting Everything by our own Elizabeth Suarez. Also, stay tuned because October 3rd through 6th, we will be having the first National Latino Leadership Symposium. Dr. Rodriguez will be joining us, as will Elizabeth Suarez and a host of other Latino presenters. 
but even more important, we are going to have, well, not more important because we love our people, but we're also going to be learning mainstream leadership. And I'm proud to announce today that Dr. Barry Posner, who is the author of the Leadership Challenge, considered one of the top 100 business books of all time, will be joining us to talk about the Leadership Challenge. And I will be working with him to show him and everyone else how his principles are our principles. Latinos may call it something different, like Si Se Puede is his challenge, the process, to always be looking for innovation, for new ways of doing things. So please plan on joining us here in Denver on October 3rd through 6th. And finally, we're here to serve you. Please send us your ideas. We'll be hearing more from Lideramos about how you can join with us in creating a Latino leadership movement in this country. We are poised, strategically poised, to become the leaders of this century. But we can only do that if we work together, if we have our skills and abilities sharpened, if we're connected to our culture, and if we have a vision for the future. So thank you for joining us. I want to thank the board members that have made this organization possible, to the American Express Foundation and the Kellogg Foundation Trustee Fund for making these webinars and our symposium possible. Have a beautiful evening, go forth, have a great day and pass the message, Latino leadership is on the move. Muchas gracias. Great job.